hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today on this exciting topic on edge machine learning. My name is uh, Nikolai Stolung. I'm a data scientist and machine learning consultant at Trifor in Copenhagen. And my job is to build software solutions that rely on data of every kind to meet our clients' needs. I have a background in econometrics, which is uh, statistics for economists, and I have been part of a few startups within FinTech. This is uh, the agenda for the uh, virtual tech update. We will high level cover artificial intelligence and machine learning. Then we'll move on to understand what cloud and edge machine learning is. Finally, I'll showcase a solution from Velux with uh, Trifog as a partner. Firstly, um, I'm gonna say a few words on Trifog. We are an IT company working with building custom software solutions for our clients. We are approaching uh, 700 employees across 45 locations. And we have this philosophy of being organized into small units so we can remain agile and be very close to our clients. Okay, moving on into uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So what is artificial intelligence and machine learning? I like these definitions uh, of AI. Um, strong AI our machine is machines that can think and act in a way that matches or surpasses human intelligence. So strong AI is basically the robots taking over, right? Well, we're not really there yet. So when I speak about AI, I'm referring to the weak definition of AI. Any activity computers are able to perform that humans once performed. So in AI, we have this tool called machine learning. Machine learning is the technology of learning from past behavior by establishing relationships to make future predictions. We can think of similar activities such as statistics, but this is not uh, encompassing. Inside machine learning, we have another tool called deep learning. Deep learning is the idea that relationships can be established without humans necessarily understanding these relationships. That is why we refer to <laughs> Deep learning is inspired by how our brains work, where billions of connections between these neuron cells can make us think and act in an according to what we have already learned. So why do we need machine learning at all? Machine learning have proven to optimize productivity because first of all, it lives inside a computer and computers doesn't have the basic needs of human beings. Furthermore, computers are generally faster at concluding than humans are. For example, with mathematics, which machine learning is built upon. Can, can I just ask the audience to mute the microphones? I'm constantly getting uh, clicks and, and hisses from uh, unmuted microphones. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Please mute your, mute, mute your microphone uh, while Nicola is presenting. Thank you. Okay, so if some of you don't know what, uh, what this is, then this is the first recorded image of a black hole. Some might know that black holes are so far away from our planet that they are undetectable by human eyes. But somehow, researchers were able to gather a lot of data from modern telescopes and match that with how human perceives uh, through their uh, human perceives vision through their eyes and then use deep learning to construct an image of a black hole. My point here is that some tasks that were not seen as feasible for humans once can now be solved by machine learning. This allows for a greater innovation space, but of course there are challenges that comes along such as explainability. I guess uh, most people what knows what uh, this device is, an external navigation device. Most have probably had one, I know I did, but this is probably not the case anymore because some years ago, in came this guy, Google Maps. Google suddenly just decided to give navigation away for free, but not only navigation, route planning based on current traffic, all based on machine learning. Motor transportation is a global technology and thus the need for navigation and traffic has exploded immensely. But I'll come back to how route planning uh, in Google Maps is even possible. My point here is that many people have turned to Google Maps for navigation instead of having that external device sitting next to their dashboard. So how do you build 
uh, machine learning. Machine learning is relatively easy to get started with, but somehow difficult to implement and start deriving value from. And why is that? So you need the intersection of knowledgeable people, technology, and processes, which for many companies is a cultural change. Data scientists uh, like me don't necessarily have the software skills required to build modern software. We're just glorified statisticians. So the gap between me and a software developer often causes challenges that needs to be addressed. Machine learning is not like building, so building classical software. It needs to be done iteratively and with a lot of trial and error. That's why it's really important to test your hypotheses before scaling up a solution. It really comes down to choosing the uh, correct software and hardware because in real life there are many other aspects than just accuracy that needs to be addressed. Bear in mind that many can build machine learning, but only few are actually successful in continuously deriving value from it. So moving on to cloud machine learning and what kind of monster this is. In order to understand what cloud machine learning is, I'll start with an example. So I like to sail, and when you sail, you have this option to call in for a weather forecast. Once this was the only option you had, to talk to someone who is an expert on the weather, so you called him, right? Because we live in a world where weather experts are a scarce resource, then it makes sense to build a computer that can answer these requests that are now coming in from all over the world. The problem occurs when you want to make forecasts, right? Forecasts are per definition inaccurate, but imagine you as a weather, ex weather expert delivering these weather forecasts in any given location at any given time. It's not really feasible, right? So this is where cloud machine learning comes in. Remember machine learning is about predictions. So you can now have machine learning on a computer doing these forecasts automatically. So experts can focus on something else like the weather, for example, and not answering calls coming in. If we go a little deeper into cloud uh, machine learning, then we can divide it into two separate groups, roughly. First, we have custom machine learning, which kind of looks like this. This is a lot of code, which mainly experts can read. But it is really not about it. It's about these guys. This is a graphics card, a graphical processing unit, in short, GPU. They are very good at doing a lot of stuff at the same time, which is perfect for machine learning. These GPUs have enabled machine learning to emerge from research and into our daily lives, really. Then we have what, we, what I refer to as pre-trained. Pre-trained is a product that you can take off the shelf, like object detection in this case, where we can find cars and people in, in images. But we cannot distinguish cars from each other or distinguish people from each other. Another example could be translation and speech to text. These products in pre-trained mostly fit all and no problems. That means they're commonly used for general tasks like recognizing a car in an image uh, or transcribing a phone call. They are not domain specific, which is where you would need custom machine learning, which is our main focus in Trifold. Okay. So that was cloud machine learning, which, um, which is really, really important for us to understand what edge machine learning is, because they're both very similar and very much different. I'll start out with an analysis uh, from Gartner uh, that says by 2025, 75% of all enterprise data will be generated and processed outside centralized data centers, compared with 10% in 2018. This is why I wanted uh, to think about uh, where your data will be processed in the future if you were a little early and saw that. So, but the trend here is that companies will generate most of their data inside, let's say, their factory, because factories get smarter and companies become so more digital. I think you're breaking up a little. Okay, um, I'll try to speak a little slower. So the no, trend here... The trend here is that, can you please mute? Thank you. Uh, the trend here is that companies will generate most of the data inside their factory, right? So all because they get smarter. So from where I'm standing, this is very much driven by manufacturing, logistics, and asset management. This is a lot of data that you would otherwise have to move if you're not processing it 
at the site which most likely to deliver value, value anyway. So you can ask yourself why even move it and risk the complications of security and costs. So if we pull out the example from before, here you would get uh, you would request for weather uh, predictions, um, and then we have established that data and requests are increasing. That puts a strain on your entire data management. What if you don't have to move it, but can replicate your entire data processing system on site without the critical issues such as security, data, data transferring, and processing costs? I think that's a preferable scenario for many. But um, in comes this guy. Now most of us are walking around with a pretty strong computer in our pocket. Uh, this is the edge, right? Processing data outside your centralized data center. So why move and pay for data that is only relevant for that specific user? Because I will argue that very, very few are looking at each individual data point for their customers, factories, or anything else inside their database. Data tends to be more valuable for us humans in the aggregate scale. That allows us to check for patterns and compare to previous year. So my question again is, why move it and process it at your centralized data center when now people have this phone in their pocket? So if we take a look at how this technology is moving, then in 2009, these square boxes started popping up on our smartphones, telling us where faces was in a picture. Now, as you might notice, edge machine learning started with consumers, such as many other successful technologies, such as the smartphone. In 2014, NVIDIA, which is a leading manufacturer of graphics cards, launched their Jetson platform for edge machine learning. The idea was to be able to run sophisticated and complex machine learning, such as computer vision, uh, in industrial robots. Computer vision is by far the, um, the, the area in machine learning that has moved uh, the fastest. So the Jetson platform is highly successful and NVIDIA is providing a lot of open source software for developers to build applications that are running these complex models. Okay. So now I have a question for you. Uh, and please type in the, an uh, the answer in the uh, chat function. So how many people bought a new smartphone within the last 18 months? Oh, we're just gonna wait a few seconds. Julie, if you can um, just get a quick overview of the, the uh, answers. So there is already at least 25 that have uh, confirmed that they have bought uh, a smartphone within the last yeah, year. That's, that's a, it's a question, I, it's a kind of a trick question and I already know the answer because I've, I've asked it in so many uh, of, my, um, of my presentations so far and it's by far most people that bought a new smartphone. So why do I wanna talk about this? So in 2018, as you might notice on the, the picture here, we saw the first dedicated chips in smartphones that were purpose-built for machine learning. So now we have our hardware in our smartphones, out in our pockets, that are only for machine learning. So if you have an Android device, these chips are already available for developers. Uh, with Apple, it's slightly more limited as they, by default, have more applications running. But what I mean is that the technology is out there. So edge machine learning is everywhere. Okay. I'm going to show a video now uh, from um, Alibaba on how edge machine learning looks like in logistics. So Alibaba is this Chinese um, online retailer um, and we'll see how they've handled logistics in a sorting warehouse by using machine learning. So before I show it, I have to warn you about some issues that might occur. So please turn up your volume now if it's not at the loudest so you can hear the narrator. And the video might lag a little for some of you, but I'll elaborate after. It's just a short video. This is a 1.3 square kilometer transit warehouse. The use of sorting robots improves efficiency, accuracy, and security during the sorting process, and also reduces manual labor costs by an astonishing 70%. This AI logistics model is now revolutionizing the express delivery industry the country that's pretty cool right so um and if you notice the speaker then the business case was quite strong alibaba experienced an increase in efficiency accuracy and security and were able to reduce manual labor costs by 70 percent 
So the, the robots here are figuring out uh, themselves on how to effect, efficiently navigate this forest of other ro robots with the same goal. I think sorting robot is a great example of where to implement machine learning at the edge. Um, it's a task that requires a, uh, a large amount of manual labor. It's prone to unnoticed errors due to its re repetitive nature, and it really has a volume that supports a case of automation. Okay, so um, I wanna show you something uh, in quality assurance that we've been working on in Trifork for our client, Vilux. Some of you might know Vilux, um, and uh, I'm really excited about this one because it's truly an edge machine learning solution with all that it entails. So this, was a, this is a very challenging task, which we love in Trifork. So I'm really happy that Vilux chose us to build the solution for them. Um, Vilux is a global manufacturer of high quality windows. They have 27 production facilities in 10 countries. And as most other manufacturers, Vilux has um, a, some defects on their, the components they're producing. And those are the ones that we wanna address before these components are being shipped to customers. So, for that, Velux already have a quality assurance process in place. That process detects and classifies errors in a critical time of, of production. This is where, this is, um, this is right before windows are assembled. And to keep the cost of defects as low as possible, so uh, components with defects are not sent to uh, customers. Locating errors in a critical time in production um, is vital since the replacement costs are way larger than the cost of a single component. So being, by being an innovative company, um, I think Velux um, is the perfect place to build and run machine learning. They really understand their business. Um, and um, let's take a look at it. So this is how a typical quality assurance setup looks like. From the left side, components are coming out of the production line for manual inspection. This is to determine if there are any defects on these components. If there's a defect, um, then it is taken off the line for more thorough inspection. Furthermore, all defects are registered on site by inspectors. The first version of the solution looks like this. We call it assisted quality assurance. Here we've added a camera, which you see in the left side of the illustration. The camera takes images of all the components and sends it to a computer, which then determines if there are any defects. If there are any defects, then the component is automatically registered and flagged for quality inspectors on the dashboard in front of them. Then they can remove it from the production line. The solution requires, this solution uh, requires a very high processing speed because Velux has a highly optimized production line as, and as you would expect, of any companies this size. So we simply don't have time to transfer the image data to a central server and wait for the results. That is the main reason we process the data at the edge. But furthermore, we are using, by using this edge technology, we don't have to worry about security, connectivity, and every production line will work independent of each other. We also need a high accuracy for the solution to work as intended. Like I mentioned, they already have a process in place and we wanna improve that. So defects tend to be very small, and in order for us to catch all of them, we need to zoom in and take multiple pictures of each component. I'll get back to that uh, in just a minute. So we need both speed and accuracy. Normally in machine learning for computer vision, accuracy and speed are considered a trade-off. So uh, let's, uh, but I'll come back to that as I mentioned. Complete automation is the version that we're aiming for. This is where robots are controlled by the decisions from the machine learning. The solution involves state-of-the-art research in computer vision and the newest hardware technology. Um, the thorough manual inspection that comes in later is replaced by cameras, computers, and business logic. So, we, um, so the replacing uh, the costly and uh, re repetitive process which quality inspection is. We are integrating with Microsoft products such as Azure and Power BI to operate and monitor the solution. Furthermore, we're using a new version of the product, uh, Azure Stack Edge, which allows us to run the most sophisticated machine learning at a very high speed. And I want to elaborate on the Azure Stack Edge because 
Um, before we, we, we move to see this uh, solution in action, I want to elaborate uh, a little bit on it. In this setup, it is a key component for us to build the solution. But why do we need it, right? First of all, because it's really fast. As you will see in a moment, we need to process images at an incredible speed. Every image frame will need to be evaluated within 15 milliseconds. In comparison, then blinking an eye takes 100 milliseconds if you're fast. So the stack edge can be defined as a whole lot of computing power at the edge. Second of all, we need to run the most sophisticated machine learning models. This makes it a very, this makes it a very flexible device compared to other similar devices. My point is here, we don't have to build custom hardware anymore to meet the most strict requirements. You can get that stack edge with two NVIDIA Tesla T4 GPUs, which are normally considered data center GPUs and not edge GPUs. This also makes the stack edge the strongest device out there today. So a single Tesla T4 is 90 times faster than a laptop. But then you can have 16 concurrent models on the two GPUs, which on, in a multiple camera setup makes sense and makes it even faster. So um, it, it's, it's 1,440 times faster than a laptop. That's quite impressive. These numbers are all from testing that we have done as part of the solution, not from any official statistics. So because of the flexibility and strength of the Azure Stack Edge, we can meet those requirements of the solution and provide the best technology possible. Okay, so this is a video from the assembly line uh, from one camera from above. So what you will see is a wood, com wood component at a critical time in production. That means after they've been cut, after they've been painted. So please notice the speed um, which is, is uh, processed. In. And like I mentioned earlier, the machine learning cannot take more than 15 milliseconds to, to be done evaluating. The video is 20 frames per second, which is 50 milliseconds. And those remaining 35 milliseconds, we need to transfer data uh, into our algorithm and wrap business logic around it. So everything is moving very, very fast. Okay, let's see it. Well, that doesn't make much sense to us, but I would like you, you, you to understand at what speed we're going here. So what if we slow it down 40 times and only look at defects? So what I want you to notice now are the green squares in the images. Well, as you can see, we're not only able to find components with defects on, we're also able to locate them on the component for inspectors. Then we can wrap some business logic around that information. And I think that's pretty, pretty, that's, that's very cool. Okay, so I'll wrap up with some key takeaways uh, from my presentation. Uh, several companies have now embraced Industry 4.0. As I've shown today, uh, logistics and manufacturing are an ideal place to implement, implement machine learning in robots. And I know for a fact that another interesting area is asset management. The technology is here and it's been commercialized. We can put this entire technology on your smartphone today. When I talk about edge machine learning, I always, uh, well, I always ask about the question and you answered um, how many people have bought a new smartphone within the last 18 months. And most people did. So I'm, you know, it's, 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 I'm, not, I'm not the one arguing for it here, actually. It's, it's out there. So keep your data. Uh, processing at the site where it generates value. Why move it when it's not necessary? And that makes me jump to my last point. This technology really emphasizes performance, security, and most often comes with a large reduction in operational costs. Well, thank you very much. And um, we'll now take some questions and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Neulai. So uh, a few of you have already uh, written some questions in the chat, both uh, privately and, and to everyone. So please continue to do so. We have a few questions here that we will get started on. So the first question here, and I think uh, the initial two are very much related to the case you just presented, Nivlai. The first one here is, can we use this technology in other areas? And then it's been followed up with uh, for instance, predictive maintenance or product line optimization. 
So uh, uh, yes, yes, for sure. You know, uh, like I said, we um, it's uh, well. If you talk about computer vision, um, uh, predictive maintenance uh, are mainly are mainly data that comes out of a system. So it's not really vision data, right? But so we can always build machine learning around predictive maintenance uh, if data is coming out of your factory. Let's say from an engine or from uh, some kind of uh, other um, uh, um, yeah, uh, process uh, you have out in your factory. Uh, but you know, uh, when it comes to this particular case, we can always move the camera you know, down or up the line, depending on where it will make sense to add it. So it, I, normally I, I say, if you can see it, then a camera can see it. And maybe a camera can, can, can even see it much better. Much, many of these images, uh, that um, that we that I've shown today, um, it's really hard for us to detect those 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 um, those defects in the components if we don't look at it very very thoroughly. So um, I will argue that a camera in some cases are much better. All right, thank you for that. Let's quickly jump to the next one. What's the cost of a solution like this? And this was also some uh, thing that that popped up during your presentation of the Vlox case. Okay, uh, well, I can't talk about the cost of the Velux, uh, the Velux solution. What I can say is that from a, from a machine learning and the technology that wraps the machine learning, not taking any other factors around, normally we build solutions in Trifog in the space of in around 500,000 Danish kroner to 1.5 million. Oh, but it depends on a lot. Depend, there's a lot of dependencies here. There is, there is a, a similar question here that I would just uh, like to follow up with. So the Vlox case looks like a quite, a, quite, a quite large investment. How do you prove that it's possible to get a good enough accuracy and speed before the implementation? Do you run small tests or simulate the process or something else? Yeah, it, so the uh, the main like it, building it is not really uh, it's not really uh, costly, but testing it uh, is is testing it is where um, the costs are, are because we need to be to 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 be sure. So what we have done is we we started out simply we set a camera out and build a build a box around it and started doing small tests. Then we scaled those tests up, have adding um, adding more functionality, but always testing and keeping. Um, keeping you know going to the going to the site uh, where the where the camera are testing uh, different components testing different uh, parts of the software but then we also simulate the process from our offices uh, with a physical setup and a virtual setup so the physical setup we have a camera sitting uh, with some wooden components that we can test but in a virtual setup that's where we test the speed of everything because the hardware will be will be wrapped in will be uh, controlled by some software somewhere, and the hardware is as I said we don't have to custom build it. It's out there. We can access it uh, through the cloud, so we can test those stuff. But yeah, we have we have we have a scanner, a test scanner sitting on the uh, on the production facility for the um, for the proper testing. But that's really where the the, um, the costs are in building a a, pro, a a solution like this. All right. Let's jump to another question. How does this integrate with our Microsoft Power BI or SAP solutions? So this is a custom solution. It doesn't, it doesn't, well, we don't, we don't really rely um, on, um, on other products. We have some Microsoft uh, products or some Azure products uh, in it, which is um, something we chose for the solution. But we can, we can make it, we can integrate it into everything. Uh, the Velux case also, they have a Power BI uh, set up and we integrate into that. Uh, but we could e as easily integrate to SAP. All right. Another question here for you, Nikolai. How does this connect to central learning algorithms? So this case uh, presented, we presented, uh, I guess, there will be central development of both the uh, next version, but also input to change in, changes in production setup. Yeah, let me just read it in the case. So, I'm not really sure what uh, what what is meant by the question, but um, okay. So so this is this is a question for Jesper. So maybe Jesper, you could follow up with with uh, an elaboration in the chat, and I will make sure to elaborate on it, and Nikolai will will answer it. 
And while we while you do that, I will just jump to to the next. So for the Vlog video, is it on purpose that you're very close with the camera instead of taking a higher resolution picture of the entire window frame further away? Is there an overall rule or is it not a problem for machine learning to stick images and go even closer? Uh, so you know, the closer you go, the more images you have to process. So, uh, and the, if you have a time constraint on your on your solution, then you would, um, you, then it's really a fine grained balance. Uh, but no, there is no, um, there is no overall rule. Um, the closer, the better. The larger, the um, the larger the the defect in this case, or what you're actually trying to, to recognize, the better, of course. Yeah. And I guess maybe that it also depends on on what you're searching for. Okay, and I just meant I just saw something else. Well, the thing is with these wood components in Windows, they are very long. So taking a full image um, in in a full resolution about uh, on the entire component will only have such a small part of the component in the image. So that's why we go so close. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, another question here, also related to the case. How long did it take to go from ID, idea to production? Uh, I'm not allowed to talk about that, unfortunately. So could you talk about it maybe in more general terms? So when, when you get started on a, on a project or process like this? Yes, of course. Um, so normally we, we, we proof of concept something within a few weeks. Um, it's, it's quite simple to to spin up uh, some technology that will that will that will test if machine learning works in this case. Um, then we will go through um, then we go through a planning setup to uh, to with the client and possible partners to understand what kind of um, what kind of uh, setup we're really talking about. Uh, do we need to integrate some to some software um, which can take some time? Or do we need some in this case, with production, we need to we need to push components in different directions depending on if there are uh, defects on it. We, that's also something that needs to be implemented for the solution. Um, but for it would probably be within. Um, but it, it's also depend. Normally, it will take from anywhere between three to six months from, to go from idea to production. But it could okay. take longer, and it could take could be shorter. All right, let's get back to this uh, question. And, and uh, Jesper, thank you for sending some clarifying note. He is writing, I was just thinking that you constantly need to update programs and algorithms to improve. How do you do that? So in the case, so what we, what we do, right, we, we get a lot of, when we classify errors, uh, like it's a painting error or something else, it's a scratch, we can go back into the, we can go back into the production line and say, okay, well, this part of your uh, production line creates these errors. That's what the value we generate from here. That makes everything uh, more challenging for us down the line because now we see different errors and we have, so yes, and we also have to update the machine learning constantly uh, or with some interval. We do that by pulling new, of course, by pulling new images out, testing those images. Uh, and if we don't have the correct results, then we will retrain everything to make it uh, to make it more make it closer to the reality that we're seeing right now. Okay, so we have a couple of questions here that are quite aligned with with the topic you're talking about right now. So the first one here is how do you secure that the system does not detect way too many defects that humans would not characterize as defects. So we that's why we have some business logic that comes from the domain understanding from Vlogs. So whenever we pull uh, a classification out that detects an error, then we wrap some business logic around it to understand if, uh, if that is uh, it's an error we want to skip or not skip. If we have square boxes and images, we also have size of, uh, of, uh, of defects. We also have location of defects. So without, you know, go, without going much deeper, I think um, this is me saying that we can. There is a lot of information in these square boxes that we can use. Okay, so maybe just a, a last question here related to uh, to errors. Um, how is the performance in terms of errors? Have you experienced that the camera misses any major defects, or that it detects defects that doesn't exist? So it's a bit aligned with what you were just talking about. 
um, you cannot. There's no such thing as 100% accuracy. Um, you would uh, you would you would need to to align with that fact. Um, there is no such thing as 100% accuracy in human um, in human inspection as well. So we we but the, it's 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 a in the in the setup that we have we miss something uh, definitely right now. That's why we don't have an automated uh, setup yet. Uh, but we. Uh, I'm also kind of cheating a little bit because the models that we are currently running are very, very fast. They have less complexity than other uh, computer vision models. We have computer vision models that are way better at detecting the, uh, the defects than human, human inspectors are. But we cannot use those in, uh, in the production setup right now. Okay. There are a lot of questions and I don't think even though you're, you're uh, very quick, Nikolai, and, and provides very uh, short and, and crisp answers. We won't probably go through them all, but I will try to, to uh, get us through just a couple more. So here goes another. How did you gather enough labeled data for the training, and how did you avoid human bias in the error estimation? Okay, so we have we, we the first thing we did was to build a build a, a camera box on the production line and start collecting images from uh, from the um, from the um, the camera. Then we truly yeah we labeled them. Uh, some we have done. Uh, we've actually have done it ourselves. I think uh, Rasmus, if you're here, then we can maybe talk about um, the um, the well we have we have a we have an organization that deals with um, that deals with. Uh, people who have autism that helps us label these images. Uh, but we are also using online uh, labeling tools that are available through, uh, through cloud providers. So that, uh, and that comes down to the next question, how do you avoid human bias? We have multiple entities labeling this data. So the data will be affected by as many opinions as possible. And therefore, you know, if we have a lot of people, we, uh, and we measure all the responses, we have an average and then we have consistency. I can maybe add something. We also have Ole from Velux. Ole have worked at the production line and the quality is uh, inspector for 25 years. So Ole have seen all the errors there is and Ole was a big part of actually sharing uh, the specific knowledge. What error is this? Is this a painting error? Is it wooden error? Is it a, another kind of error? So Ole really was a big help with this and it's really something we need for these customers. Uh, there is a lot of guys who have done this for many years that really know a lot about the errors. And we know, uh, we need that knowledge to actually improve the model. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, Nikolai, are you ready for just one last question? Yes, of course. This is related to the machine learning model. So is the machine learning model static or is there a component of improving training the model on site? No, the, the model is static, but we have we have a process that keeps retraining models uh, and replace them if they're better, which is we, which we expect at some point will be automatic. So it's static right now, but we definitely uh, see it as dynamic in the future. Okay, that was that was a fast one. So so let's let's take one one final one here. What is the main shortcoming of implementing such solution compared with the traditional or other technologies? If there are any, how to my, uh, mitigate and come across those? Oh, <laughs> not, um, an easy, not an easy question, but maybe you can. No, I'm, I'm pretty deep into the solution, but definitely, I think um, I think camera technology and camera software um, that uh, for for taking pictures uh, in an industrial setup is is limited to what we actually can achieve with what we have today in machine learning. Maybe I can add something. There is also classic vision detection, and a lot of companies are using this technology. But in some cases, it's not doable because, uh, in Milo's case, it's a wooden component, so the wooden structure makes the camera find way too many errors. So it was not a possibility to use classic vision. With machine learning, we can learn about these wooden uh, structures uh, in the component and not find it as an error. So a lot of these cases and a lot of other companies we have talked to have tried classic vision and it's not possible. So machine learning really opened up a lot of new cases where classic vision couldn't solve the problem. All right, thank you both. And uh, sorry that we didn't get to answer all the questions. I know that Nikolai is more than happy to jump on a call or do a follow-up meeting where you can go more into the details or get around the final questions. 
But uh, in the end here, I would like to, of course, on behalf of myself, Nicola and Trifog, thank you all for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for all your questions. And then I hope to see you on our next virtual tech update, which is happening on the 3rd of June. It's going to be uh, uh, focusing on hybrid cloud. So it's, uh, it will be around the considerations to, to make before entering into a hybrid cloud project, including some practical tips, do's and don'ts, and a deep dive into a practical case in the Danish healthcare industry. So finally, uh, thank you all for joining. Have a wonderful day and hope to see you again.